This program was made possible by the law firm of Zalman and Schnorman, whose practice is limited to personal injury and insurance law. Welcome to Lawline with your host, Alan Schnorman. Mr. Schnorman is a distinguished trial attorney, author, and lecturer. Each week, Lawline will bring you the most knowledgeable experts in the field of law today. And now, we introduce our guests and our host, Alan Schnorman. Welcome to Lawline. When Fernando Ferrar was elected Bronx Borough President in 1987, he pledged to revitalize his community by turning what was once a national symbol of urban decay into a model of urban revival. Today we'll see what Bronx Borough President Ferrar has to say about the Amadou Diallo shooting and its impact on his constituency. Also the New York Yankees and the future of the Bronx. Hello. Mr. Farrar, how Good are you? Good to be with you. Okay, Call Nick. Fernando. Okay, I will. Let me ask you something. How is the Bronx doing today? This may sound self-serving, but I think today it's doing a whole lot better uh, than uh, 15 years ago and certainly 20 years ago. No question about it. No question about it. But let's, let's get to what the opening said about uh, Amadou Diallo mm -hmm. and the shooting there. Give us your insight there. I know you've been intimately involved with the investigation and everything that's happened since. Well, that's a, it's a tragedy that troubles me enormously. Um, we've had a, a series of killings in the Bronx. Uh, um, another unarmed man shot on the subway platform, uh, Nathaniel Gaines. Yes. Um, Anthony Baez killed in a chokehold. By which a was, police officer. Which was banned. Well, these are all police officer uh, killings. Um, banned by the department since 1993. Um, this bothers me especially, in fact probably just a little more than the rest of them, although they pro bothered me profoundly, because this is about as bad as it gets. Um, and I don't need to recount all the facts that are obvious and that everybody knows. But when the district attorney came over to my office and informed me of the shooting um, that morning and told me he was immediately launching a criminal investigation, uh, that was a uh, more than signal to me that this was more than serious. Uh, district attorneys don't launch criminal investigations lightly. Now, I know what I read in the papers, but I know you've been involved with, with it from the first day. Can you mm -hmm. tell us what, what you know about what happened there, what, what they've told you? Well, they are interviewing witnesses before the grand jury, and as you know, those uh, proceedings are secret. Um, and I'm glad that there doesn't seem to be any leaking from them. Right. Uh, that's not, a good sign. I'm not sign. asking for any of that information, of course, but just basically what you know of what's happened. Here's what I know. Uh, Amadou Diallo, uh, at his door, uh, just going out, apparently, um, from his apartment um, on the ground floor, um, completely unarmed. As it turns out, absolutely no police record and not a suspect in any police investigation. Uh, confronted by apparently four cops in the street crimes unit. Um, we don't know exactly what happened. But uh, as it turns out, 41 shots were fired. Um, there was an assertion that uh, Mr. Diallo uh, was thought to have been armed, and that's why the shots were fired. Um, and that's where judgment but, comes but, into but play. But I understand no weapon was found. Absolutely no weapon was found. Uh, and 41 shots were fired. I might add, 22 of those 41 shots fired in the ceiling in the walls and into the floor uh, in a very small vestibule, which means that had there been someone peeping out of the door at that moment, that individual may well have been killed as well. Uh, Nineteen bullets found, uh, um, uh, found their mark and killed Mr. Diallo. Um, that's a killing that has provoked the most incredible expression of anger and distrust in the city I have seen in my adult life. And it's essentially because, one, the police commissioner and the mayor, the current police commissioner and the current mayor, don't mayor seem, Giuliani. Mayor Giuliani and Commissioner Safer, don't have a lot of bona fides 
with respect to uh, these kinds of killings. Uh, second, there seems to be no common sense justification for why this occurred. New Yorkers really want to know why this occurred and above all how this could have occurred. Now the street crime unit, are you familiar with those types of units? I certainly am. What are they? This is um, um, a specialized unit within the police department um, that uh, essentially was um, assigned to patrol work uh, in the evening hours. And that third shift where we used to have almost no police presence, uh, they are typically in plain clothes. Um, and in fact, in this case, we're in pursuit of a suspect who might have been the Bronx rapist. Um, and were they in plain clothes as well? At this they time? were in plain clothes as well. Um, and I can imagine, I hope I can imagine, what Mr. Diallo's last thoughts were when he's coming out of his door, sees four uh, guys who were not in uniforms coming up and drawing guns. He must have been very frightened. Uh, I can only imagine that. Um, it is going to be interesting to see what witnesses might have heard or might have seen. Um, it is my expectation that the police will not testify before the grand jury uh, and will right now start working on a trial strategy. Now, were these police officers, um, how far were they from him? I mean, was, is there any indication were they within five feet, ten feet? 30 feet? I'm not sure if ballistic uh, experts uh, and forensic experts so we, we don't know have that. testified yet and made their reports, but it was at fairly close range. I see. Uh, I know this vestibule. In fact, I went to see it again, but I know this neighborhood and I know this block on Wheeler Avenue more than very well. I live just two blocks away and I began my political career in Soundview. Uh, I know those buildings. I went to revisit uh, some days, about a week ago, uh, drove by and just reacquainted myself with the uh, vestibule. It is a very small vestibule. It's not long, it's not wide. Uh, this is a small walk-up building. Now I understand uh, from the newspapers that the federal authorities have also investigated that very crime scene. Federal authorities have investigated, and my understanding is the United States Attorney from the Southern District is monitoring this case. As you know, uh, she does not have the same jurisdiction as does the Bronx District Attorney in this matter. Uh, she'll be looking at it, I presume, as she has in similar cases, from the vantage point of civil rights violations. Now, of course, it's my understanding that um, assuming that these officers are actually go to trial mm -hmm. in the Bronx would be in your jurisdiction. Yes. And if they're convicted, it ends it. But if they're innocent, they could also be facing federal charges subsequent to that. Unquestionably. Uh, and that's, in fact, what happened to police officer Francis Lavodi uh, after he was acquitted in a non-jury trial in the Bronx um, and uh, found guilty by a federal uh, jury. Uh, under in the Southern civil District, under civil rights statutes. Where are we going with all this? I I'm sure the community, you read in the paper, every day the community is voicing their anger, mm -hmm. their frustration, and their fear. Alan, let me, let me define community here. We're not only talking about black and brown communities. We're talking about communities in every corner of the city who are beginning to express not merely concern and anguish over this, but real anger. Uh, people are scratching their heads and wondering, how could this have happened to a completely unarmed man who had a police record that was clean as a whistle? Um, so a number of things really have to happen. One, the mayor needs to take some leadership here and bring this city together, uh, reinstill trust in a police department that should inspire trust and confidence and support from every sector of the New York community. There are some things that have to occur now. Look, this shooting indicates to me, just at first blush, appealing to nothing more than my common sense, that there were at least three failures here. First, the failure of training where these officers apparently could not discern between a completely unarmed man and a man who was making threatening gestures. Second, a failure of supervision. These were four members of the street crimes unit. The nearest supervisor was around the corner and that was a lieutenant. Third, 
a failure in the adoption of uh, certain policies that may well have prevented this. And I refer to two specifically. One, in the wake of the Abner Louima incident, and everybody knows what uh, that tragedy. was about. It's an incredible tragedy. Four cops again accused of brutalizing and sodomizing uh, Mr. Louima, who was, uh, who was uh, in their custody at the time. Uh, all have been indicted on serious criminal charges and are awaiting trial. This is a very serious matter. This happened just before the mayor was going into re-election mode. He appointed a commission, which by the way, I two years ago as an adversary of his, as a potential opponent, supported him on. I thought what he did was absolutely right. Appoint the commission of unbiased citizens and even biased citizens but get to the bottom of not only this incident but what this city can do positively to reform training uh, and other matters in the police force to inspire the kind of trust and confidence and support that uh, that uh, the police department must inspire in every new yorker well those recommendations came out the election was over and the mayor disbanded the commission trashed the report and ignored their recommendations. There were very sensible training recommendations made, by the way, by individuals who were appointed not by me, but by the mayor, including people like the Staten Island Borough President, the political ally of the mayor. What everybody wants to know, we know what the past is. You mm -hmm. can't, you can't uh, change the past, mm -hmm. but everyone certainly wants to, as much as we can, correct the future. Alan, you can learn from the past to correct the future, so we have to revisit those training recommendations that were sensible ones. We have to reverse the five-year trend of systematically weakening the Civilian Complaint Review Board. I am the author of the legislation that created the first Civilian Complaint Review Board in New York City, the half-civilian, half-police. When it was turned to all civilian, I supported that legislation. I was out of the council by then and a borough president uh, in the Bronx. Um, that has to be re-strengthened as provided in law. But what uh, the population doesn't understand, mm -hmm. that after a case like Abner Louima, mm -hmm. which was such a tragedy to yeah. happen by uh, police officers, and for this to happen again, what is being done between one tragedy and the next tragedy? What type of training, what type of um, it's almost like an institutional attitude that must be corrected. That's exactly the point I make. The reason why the mayor has no bona fides in these communities is because between the time of these two tragedies, he did nothing. Did nothing. Did not adopt the recommendations made by his own commission, political allies of his, and did not move to put in place safeguards that may well have prevented something like this. However, of course, on the other side, the statistics, and the last uh, five years in the city regarding crime, crime is certainly significantly lower today than it was. Oh, I, I can see that, and that's something we should all applaud. But Alan, if the bargain New Yorkers must make for reduced crime is another Abner Louima incident a few years down the road, or another Amadou Diallo incident a few years down the road. That's a bad bargain, and it's a false bargain. Of course, how do you uh, respond to the fact that there are over 30,000 New York City police officers? And of course, there are very few officers involved in these very events which we're talking about today. There are nearly 40,000 New York City police officers. And in fact, the preponderant majority of them are hardworking, heroic. In fact, in the 43rd Precinct, where this happened, only a few days before, I went to the 43rd Precinct uh, station house in the morning to prevent citations to two hero cops who, above and beyond the call of duty, ran into a burning building and saved an entire family. The community will throw you a ticket tape parade for those things. Uh, when you show respect and love and bravery toward a community, caring and compassion toward a community, that will be returned to you by that community tenfold. Alan, the opposite is also true. We're only talking about very few. The whole key is to correct those very few. That's right. We have to take a break now. We'll be right back. We'll talk about the Yankees. Okay. You're watching Law Line. I'm Alan Schnorman, your host. Stay with us. Hello, I'm Alan Schnorman. Most of you know me as the host of Lawline. 
and you've been watching me interview some of the most knowledgeable experts in the field of law. By now you understand the importance of choosing the right attorney to represent you. With so many personal injury law firms to choose from, how do you know who to call? At Zalman and Schnorman, between my partner Ben Zalman and myself, we have over 50 years of litigation experience, and I'm proud to say a proven record of satisfied clients. Our goal is to make certain you receive fair and equitable compensation for your injury. So, if you've been injured in an accident of any kind, including a construction accident, call us at 1-800-LAW-LINE. We'll be happy to speak to you and evaluate your case, and there is no fee. If it is impossible for you to come to our office, we will come to see you. We know that this could be a very difficult time in your life, and we're there to help you. Call us or visit our website at lawline.com. Hello, you're watching Lawline. We have an exclusive interview with Bronx Borough President Fernando Ferrer. Before the break, I asked you about the Yankees and Yankee Stadium. What's the story on that? Uh, as I've been saying for a few years, uh in spite of all the uh, really uh, uh, otherworldly plans to build a new stadium on the west side of Manhattan or, uh, or the threats to go to New Jersey, I have always believed that the economics were firmly in the uh, neighborhood of keeping the Yankees right where they are in the Bronx. The mayor in his recent State of the City uh, address pretty much confirmed that by dropping his, uh, his proposal for a Yankee stadium on the west side of Manhattan um, and saying he would build a new stadium in the Bronx. Well, he's in the right neighborhood, now we gotta keep him in the right ballpark. I've offered a plan for well over a year that is architecturally creative, much more cost effective, will not only rebuild Yankee Stadium, but establish it as the centerpiece of an economic engine to rebuild the areas around Yankee Stadium, which are, by the way, city-owned, to make important synergies between the stadium, business, and jobs in the area. Now, Fernando, you've been a politician most of your professional life. Mm -hmm. I know you were the city council before mm -hmm. you were Bronx Borough president. I know, hopefully, you, you certainly ran for, for mayor. Mm -hmm. And you may very well run for mayor again. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the uh, potential battle between Giuliani and Hillary Clinton. I like that lineup. I like it an awful lot. Uh, anybody who thinks Hillary Clinton will be a pushover has got to be delusional. Uh, she has got a, a great record in education, a uh, great record in health care, a great record in crime. Her husband was the uh, one who uh, passed the crime bill and put 100,000 more cops on the street. Um, anybody who tries to uh, run against her is tougher on crime than she is makes a big mistake. So tell me about your future. Where are we going? Well, I have uh, three more years to serve as borough president of the Bronx. Uh, I've been there for nearly 12 years. It's like being the mayor of my hometown. I was born and raised and educated in the Bronx. It has really been one of the most challenging, certainly, jobs I've ever had in my life. Uh, and probably one of the most challenging urban assignments in America, considering where the Bronx was when I first took my oath of office, and where uh, we had to take it to. Uh, I haven't ac finished accomplishing everything I have set out to do. Uh, I want to do that in the next three years, and I'm certainly looking very seriously at another run for mayor. And if uh, in the Democratic primary, who do you see now as your potential opponents in that primary? Oh, I think they're all very, very strong and capable and able uh, Give me some opponents. names. I Peter Vallone, the Speaker of the City Council, with whom I served. Mark Green, the public advocate. Alan Hevesy, the Comptroller. They're all uh, very big names. Now, if Mayor Giuliani, and of course if I had a crystal ball here, if he resigns because of the senatorial race, does that make Mark Green the mayor? He doesn't have to resign to run for senator. But uh, I saw something in the newspaper about that. No, this is big brouhaha over succession. Uh, if the mayor uh, becomes the senator, which by the way is a very large assumption uh, given the fact that Hillary Clinton may well be his Democratic opponent. If he becomes mayor, he will leave before the conclusion of his term and Mark Green will succeed him and that's as provided by law in the city charter. Um, well, okay, the controller of the city of New York apparently doesn't like that idea. Um, so controller Hevesy. Controller Hevesy and um, 
public advocate Green likes that idea very much because he'd end up being mayor. My attitude is... And running as an incumbent. And running as an incumbent. My attitude is if I have some very strong beliefs as I do about the direction of this city, if I feel confident that I have already run a fifth of this city for by that time 15 years and have a story to tell about how you bring back important sectors of the economy, pieces of education and housing and jobs in this city, then I think uh, I may be ready to run the other 80%. I remember reading one time that um, to run New York City was a dead-end job. How do you feel about that? I am a, a, a product of uh, being raised in Hunts Point in the South Bronx. In fact, we didn't call it the South Bronx, that was only Hunts Point. Uh, everything I've gotten, every opportunity I've I've uh, uh, taken has been as a result of what this city has offered me. Uh, there is no better job for a kid from New York than running this city. If you were mayor of New York City, how would you run it differently than Mayor Giuliani? Well, first of all, we'd have to continue to keep crime down. That's important, but I don't want to make that false bargain uh, that I referred to before. Second, we've got to create jobs in the city. We've got to continue to generate them in spite of the fact that Wall Street rising now may well fall. I've lived through these cycles. And more real than estate a few values times. are rising all over the city. And they will fall as well one day because it's sort of Newtonian with respect to uh, these laws of gravity. Uh, we have to improve education in our public schools, make them not only uh, the pathways they have always been for the poor in the city to opportunity, but the alternatives for the middle class to remain in the city. We begin to do those things, we have a much stronger city. How do you feel about this um, legislation that uh, May uh, Mayor Giuliani is relying upon that if you're arrested, for intoxication while driving, we take your car. Whether the car is a small car costing $12,000 or one that's costing $60,000, that car is ours. Uh, I will tell you this. I've had some experience with drunk drivers uh, and drivers uh, uh, killing pedestrians while under the influence, maiming pedestrians, destroying property, uh, endangering pedestrians. I will tell you this. Given certain safeguards, which means there should be a conviction because you still believe in the American Constitution. Uh, I have no difficulty at all with confiscation of vehicles, provided there is a conviction. Provided there is a conviction. That's correct. Now, I understand that you won't be able to, even if you're um, found not to be uh, guilty of intoxication while driving, drunk driving, you can still lose your car for up to 30 days, the use of it. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, the city will have to... Uh, We'll have to uh, develop a legal strategy with its corporation counsel for dealing with the mountain of lawsuits that will ensue. I don't think they thought this one out very, very well. Uh, my view still holds uh, that uh, we've got to be able to put ourselves in a position to send a very clear message to people who will get behind the wheel while under the influence that they may not do that that we will seize your vehicle just as if you cross the George Washington Bridge to buy some cocaine in Washington Heights. We will seize your vehicle. You're violating the law. You know, let's go back. Earlier you said you have to look at history to deal with the future. Mm -hmm. If you were the mayor now, mm -hmm. and not the Bronx Borough President, mm -hmm. and you had the Abner Louima case, and then you had the Diallo case, mm -hmm. what would you have done? I would have implemented those training recommendations of the Louima Commission. I would not have uh, weakened the Civilian Complaint Review Board. In fact, I would have made it the independent agency it was meant to be by law, given it the opportunity to, uh, to demand um, uh, investigations independently of the police department of alleged police misconduct, and to recommend appropriate penalties for them. I would have implemented even more than that a lot of the key recommendations of the Mullen Commission. Uh, uh, as you know, the commission chaired by former presiding justice of the second department, Milton Mullen. Um, and then you've got to make some uh, very tough decisions in the police department. One is you've got to reverse the decision to cut the number of supervisors and sergeants. Going to increase that number commensurate with the increase in patrol strength. Second, while it's a great idea to establish pathways into the police department from school security guards and traffic enforcement agents, the mayor only last year cut the police cadet program, which was in 
designed to do just that. Restore the police cadet program, but do even more. You want to diversify patrol strength to make it look like the rest of the city? Diversify all ranks of the police department, the hierarchy, all the way up to chief of department. Let's make talk, it look like the city too. Let's talk about guns. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more scary than being a, a subway car knowing that there could very well be a gun in that particular subway car. Yes. How do we get the guns off the street? How do we get the guns away from the children? I have... Uh, some people who are cursed with a long memory will remember in August of 1990, there was a front page story in the uh, Daily News written by Bob Herbert, men with the news, which said the uh, headline was enough already. And it was an interview with me uh, saying to Mayor Dinkins at the time, you've got to hire 7,000 more cops to get these guns and drugs off the streets. And it was a consequence of a shooting on the Grand Concourse and behind an apartment door, while shots were fired through the door, a child was killed. We have to get guns off the street and cop, more cops help us do that. Communities want more cops in their neighborhoods and better trained cops and more sensitive cops, but they want the guns and the drugs off the streets. I also very much like the lawsuit that's going on in the Eastern District against the gun manufacturers. They know what they're doing. They're producing more guns than the uh, demand requires. Guns that can be easily transported into states with strong gun laws like New York State, uh, from states with very weak gun laws uh, like Virginia and the Carolinas. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's stuff that's killing our young people, killing old people, serving as vehicles for crime. Now, in our high schools, uh, guns have been found right in lockers throughout our city. Mm -hmm. Would you put metal detectors in our high schools? There are already metal detectors in a tremendous number of high schools. Uh, that's a tough thing. Uh, having magnetometers uh, for kids to pass through. Uh, that's why I prefer smaller schools. When you have these schools that are like factories with four to 6,000 kids in them, no teachers and no principals knowing uh, the uh, student body there, uh, anything can go on in the school. We have to have smaller schools where, especially high schools, where students and teachers and counselors know them a whole lot better, can keep an eye on the situation a whole lot better, and you can keep control of uh, a lot of the students who are disrupted. That's why I supported the uh, SOS schools, the special schools set up to take the most disruptive kids out. In the moment we had left, have left, if Mayor Giuliani is watching this program, what would you like to say to him? Rudy, this is your chance to really establish some bona fides with people in this city. Implement the sensible training recommendations of the Louisiana Commission. Implement the recommendations of the Mullen Commission. Stop weakening the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Uh, not only proceed with the very good idea of diversifying patrol strength, but do it at all ranks of the police department. And then people will really see that you care about not only strengthening the police department, but strengthening a police department that inspires the trust and confidence and support of every New Yorker. Fernando Ferrer, Bronx Borough President, thank you for being on Lawline. Thank you, Alan. And as always, this is Alan Schnorman. Thank you for watching Lawline. You have been watching Lawline with your host, New York trial attorney, Alan Schnorman. Mr. Storman will be back with you next week at the same time. If you have any questions about this week's program, please write to Law Line, 63 Wall Street, New York, New York, 13005. Or call area code 212-432-9111. This program was made possible by the law firm of Zalman & Schnorman, whose practice is limited to personal injury and insurance law.